Thank you all for attending this evening and those who are watching on the live stream and the social hall, welcome as well. Thank you for all being here with us. I want to begin with a, just a few brief thank yous. First of all, a big thank you to Paul and Karen Levy for hosting this phenomenal Levy Forum that the community is enjoying so much, addressing critical issues of the times we're living in. I also want to give a big thank you to Michael Palakoff, the director, executive director of ACTA, a phenomenal organization that ensures that the values being taught on our campuses represent what our country stands for. And that's the enduring, everlasting answer to what we are experiencing today to make sure that our education system is raising our youth to be patriotic to our country and to our greatest ally, Israel. And thank you for partnering with us. And I encourage you to look up ACTA, learn more about their important work, get to know Michael as I have. He's a mensch par excellence. I looked up the word mensch in the Webster Dictionary and I saw Michael's picture there. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for helping us and partnering in this wonderful program and bringing these phenomenal speakers. I also want to take this uh, opportunity to thank Rabbi Schneier Minsky, who behind the scenes organizes all of these events, including the Critical Conversation series that Paul and Terry and the Singer Foundation sponsor. It's a lot of work that goes into planning and orchestrating these events, and a big thank you to Rabbi Schneier Minsky. <laughs> Diplomacy and the art of peacemaking is a real skill and a real art. This week's Torah portion talks about the half shekel. We read a special reading this Shabbat because Sunday and Monday will be Rosh Chodesh Adar, the happiest month when we celebrate Purim. And in honor of Rosh Chodesh being Sunday and Monday, we read about the commandment that when the Jewish people built the temple, every Jew was commanded to give a half shekel. The rich could not give more and the poor cannot give less. And our rabbis teach us that what this teaches us is the importance of unity, collaboration, that we as a community can only succeed if we work hand in hand and realize that we are all halves of the other whole and without each other we're incomplete. And when I think about America and Israel, when I think about the Jewish and non-Jewish community, I think about the two halves of the coin, that none of us could do the job alone. We need allies, we need friends and Israel's greatest ally is the United States of America and America's greatest ally is Israel and when we have friends like John Bolton who, by the way, is not Jewish, but is one of the strongest, outspoken advocates, supporters, defenders of Israel. This, these are the partnerships that we in the Jewish community cherish and applaud you, Ambassador, for your outspoken, staunch support of our greatest ally in the Middle East, the State of Israel. It is now my honor to call upon the sponsor of the Levy Forum. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Paul Levy. Thank you, I'll be very brief. We're gonna open this up for questions. Uh, and please, when you ask a question, don't make a speech. There are gonna be a lot of people here who have an interest in, in, in posing questions. I don't wanna cut short anybody. That's number one. Number two, I wanna acknowledge the presence of uh, Paul Singer because the Singer Foundation has been terrific, by, as proven by the presence of so many of you here tonight, there's obviously great and intense interest in what's going on in Israel and the Middle East. His foundation, the Paul Singer Foundation, offers daily an email updating the situation as they see the facts and learn about them. So it's available to everybody for free, it's really worth it. I think you'll appreciate it. With that, uh, I'd like to turn this over to Michael Polyakov, and we'll get on to the program as rapidly as possible. Short question. Good evening to public service announcements. Uh, please turn off phones. And um, second, the order of events tonight, uh, we're gonna hear from Ambassador Bolton and then Ambassador Bolton and I will have a exchange of some questions and discussion topics, and then we'll have question and answer from the audience, and please observe what Paul Levy has uh, admonished, that we'll keep these confined to questions, not 
little speeches. So thank you, Rabbi Shiner, for being such a wonderful partner and for all you've done to create in the Palm Beach Synagogue an intellectual hub, uh, not only for Palm Beach, but beyond. It's a real joy and honor to work with you. And to Paul and Karen Levy, whose generosity and vision have created a forum where we can address the most challenging issues of the day. And the size of this enthusiastic audience is testimony to having such a wonderful guest and ambassador, John Bolton. As president of the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, or ACTA for short, it's a real privilege to work with all of you and to help the Levy Forum and the Palm Beach Synagogue serve this community and to uphold that value of intellectual openness, which is the heritage and the lifeblood of Judaism and one that is at the very core, the DNA of our nation. I want to thank those in the audience whose generosity has helped ACTA to build its Campus Freedom Initiative now in its second year and making breakthroughs in intellectual diversity and freedom of speech. The establishment last week of the new School of Civic Life and Leadership at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill is one of those recent breakthroughs. And a generous funder has placed before us a $1 million challenge grant. In keeping with your capacity, please help us to continue and to expand the Campus Freedom Initiative. It's now my honor to introduce Ambassador John Bolton. In the words of President George W. Bush, he is a tireless defender of the nation's values. And that is writ large in a career that has included high-level service in the administration of President Ronald Reagan, service and service as the US ambassador to the United Nations, where he spearheaded the campaign to overturn the disgraceful, the appalling UN resolution that Zionism is racism. Thank you for that. And most recently, he served as the National Security Advisor, which is chronicled in his wonderful memoir, The Room Where It Happened. In this ongoing 40-year career of service at the highest level of government and in non-governmental agencies, he has, with fierce courage, defended the security of the United States and America's role in global leadership. Please welcome Ambassador John Bolton. Thank you very much uh, to everybody, and, and Paul in particular, for this, this forum. Thanks to all of you for, for coming tonight. Uh, and uh, it, it is a especially important time to meet. I, I would like to try and uh, get a, a little context here because I think that the developments in the Middle East uh, since October the 7th are a reflection of a, a major change in world affairs that, uh, that with Israel in this much danger, this critical position, uh, it's kind of the epicenter of the reflection of how this change is occurring. And it starts outside the Middle East. My, my view is the post-Cold War era is over. Uh, it uh, ended last year with the creation of a new axis between Beijing and Moscow. Uh, that axis has a long way to go to develop, but it's pretty clear. It has its outriders, North Korea, Iran, Syria, Belarus, and others. Uh, and the relations among the participants in this axis are going to have effects all over the world that will be more connected than appear. Uh, I think the West as a whole, frankly, has not adopted, it doesn't understand that we're in a time of enormous change. I don't think that we acted effectively uh, in February of uh, 2021, 22, when the Russians invaded Ukraine for the second time. Uh, I think this has given great hope to the adversaries of the West, the global West as a whole. Uh, and I think the situation in the Middle East is a second time of testing that we're not reacting to very well. So I'm not going to rehearse events that all of you know, but I am going to give a different strategic twist to what's actually happening uh, in, in the Middle East. Uh, because it's misrepresented in the media and misunderstood by too many of our political leaders. 
What's happening right now is not uh, an Arab-Israeli war. Uh, it's not a Palestinian-Israeli war. This is a war by Iran against Israel, using terrorist proxies to achieve its objectives. Uh, it is part of what the Iranians themselves call their ring of fire strategy uh, around Israel, around the Gulf Arab states, and ultimately around the United States. Uh, this is a plan that's been in, uh, in the building for, for many, many years. I think we know what Iran's overall objectives are uh, uh, strategically. Number one, they want hegemony in the Middle East. Number two, they want hegemony within Islam. And the ring of fire strategy is, is a, a step in that direction. Iran has had enormous success uh, ever since the revolution of 1979 in creating and growing terrorist groups. Let's not forget that the terrorist who bombed the American embassy in the summer of 1983 in Beirut, who bombed the Marine barracks later that fall, were terrorists who later became components of Hezbollah, put together by the Iranians. Hezbollah is now their crown jewel. They have uh, bestowed on it something by public estimates, something in the range of 120 to 150,000 missiles, which are in arsenals that Hezbollah controls in uh, in, in Lebanon and probably in Syria. Uh, and Iran has done this uh, uh, elsewhere with Hamas, uh, with the Houthis in Yemen, with uh, Shia militia groups in Iraq and Syria. Uh, over decades now, they have helped shape these groups, trying to make the militia in Iraq, for example, into an Iraqi Hezbollah. Uh, they have taken advantage of splits uh, within the Arab world. They have gotten Hamas, which started as a, uh, as a religious, radical religious alternative to the PLO and turned it into an arm of the, of the, of the Persian Shia state. Uh, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, another Sunni Arab group, are surrogates of Iran as well. And for all these groups, they have armed them, they have equipped them, they have trained them, they have financed them for decades. And they didn't do it to suit the convenience of the terrorist groups. They did it to suit their own convenience. Now, what exactly Iran's objectives are in the near term, uh, beginning with what happened on October the 7th. I don't know. I can't discern it. I don't think it's going very well for them. Uh, if you ask them how uh, Hamas is doing against the IDF. But remember, Iran views m many of these terrorist elements as expendable. Uh, they can be used as weapons, and their defeat doesn't really hurt Iran. And for everything that's happened in the region since October the 7th, remember, nothing in Iran has been touched. Nothing. They have paid no price. And as long as the aggressor doesn't pay a price, it will continue aggression. Very, very straightforward. So let's, let's look at, uh, at, at these developments and ask, what is the proper American response? What is the proper response of the West as a whole, and I mean by that the global West, including Japan and other countries that are industrial democracies. Hamas did not wake up one fine morning on its own and say, let's attack Israel. Uh, that just didn't happen. Now, I have urged this point since October the 7th, and talking to media people, they say, well, where's the direct order from, Haran to, from Iran to Hamas. Can you, can you show the direct order? Look, the Israeli intelligence services missed the attack in its entirety, and so did American intelligence services. Is it any wonder that we missed the communications that launched the attack to begin with? Of course not. And besides that, it's not a case of a direct order. In the NATO alliance, the world's most successful political military alliance in history, the United States doesn't say, okay, France, tomorrow you do this. And by the way, Germany, you do that. That's not the way it works 
in the alliance, of which we are the undisputed leader. That's not how you do alliance management. But don't have any, uh, any misimpression about what Hamas thought it was doing. I think the Iranians miscalculated. I think they thought that the divisions within Israel, uh, the criticism of the government might have snapped something, might have brought the government down, might have spread dissension within Israel, may have weakened uh, Israel to the point that additional steps could have been taken, perhaps by Hezbollah. I don't think they estimated the reaction in Israel to that barbarity on October the 7th, which uh, seems to me at least has unified Israel in ways that people couldn't really understand. But that didn't communicate itself to the larger West. And so what we have now in capitals in Europe and the United States is an effort to act like October 7th never happened. And to say, this is the opportunity to create the two-state solution. Meaning, effectively, the IDF is now fighting in Gaza in order to put the Palestinian Authority in charge. Wonder if anybody's told the IDF soldiers that's what they're there for. I don't think they think that's what they're there for. People have not understood that the, that the idea that has existed for 75 years now that all Palestinians are refugees hereditarily hasn't worked. The world since 1945 went through enormous refugee flows in the aftermath of World War II. And many of you in this room have families that were part of those refugee flows. It is and has been international humanitarian doctrine since then that refugee status is something to uh, get over as soon as possible. That the refugees should either be returned to their country of origin or where that's not possible, resettled in a third country. Obviously, the refugees are not going to be resettled in Israel, and they don't want it. They should be resettled for their own humanitarian good. And this idea that refugee status is hereditary is a toxic idea that has led to Gaza becoming a high-rise refugee camp where there's no viable economy and never will be. But people are talking about rebuilding it as if Nothing had happened on October the 7th. This is not the kind of thinking that's going to lead to peace and stability in the Middle East. It's going to lead to more conflict. And what has happened uh, as the conflict has continued is that Iran, in other fronts, has turned up the pressure on the West to, to force Israel to accept, in effect, acknowledging that uh, they have a right to self-defense but only a limited right to self-defense. You don't want to allow Israel actually to beat Hamas. So the Houthi rebels in Yemen, who have used Iranian weapons before to attack civil airports in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, oil infrastructure in Saudi in particular, are now attacking commercial shipping and our naval vessels in the Red Sea. They have effectively closed the Suez Canal to international traffic. Suez Canal carries 30% of the world's cargo traffic uh, in order to put economic pressure on the West. The Houthis wouldn't have two rocks to rub together if the Iranians didn't give them drones and missiles. This is an effort to bring the West to put more pressure on Israel. And waiting on the sidelines with those 120,000, 150,000 rockets in the north is Hezbollah, the jewel in the crown of terrorist groups that Iran has created. Uh, to, to think that you can solve the problem in Gaza and bring peace to the region while Hezbollah is still fully armed and still fully determined uh, to make life impossible in Israel is a pipe dream. And by the way, the Shia militia in Iraq and Syria that conducted over 170 attacks on American military and civilian personnel since October the 7th, including bombing our embassy compound twice, uh, are totally under Iran's control, as we can see by the actions of Iran in dialing back their activities after finally there was an effective retaliation when three Americans were killed after one militia attack. Iran's strategy, as I said, is not clear, 
but in these four different areas, like rheostats on a light switch, it can turn the conflict up and it can turn the conflict down. I think unless you look at this uh, in, a, in that strategic context, you're never going to have an effective resolution to the conflict. Uh, people in uh, public life in our country and Europe talk about not wanting a wider war. We have been in a wider war since October the 7th. This is not a one-front war, it's a four-front war. And unless we understand that and, and our resolve to carry through to victory uh, the uh, efforts now by the Israeli government, we're, we're simply going to have a lot more lives lost in vain because that objective won't be reached. The government of Israel, the war cabinet, the coalition government says that its objective is the elimination of Hamas uh, as, a, as a military and political force. People say, well, you can't kill an idea. What, how does this end? You can't kill an idea. I don't know. In World War II, I think we destroyed the Nazi idea, and it was brutal. People say, but, but, but Israel's gone too far, that the, the death and destruction in Gaza are now unacceptable. The death and destruction in Gaza are unacceptable. Ask who's responsible for it the barbarians who put their own civilians at risk in order to protect themselves. Uh, I, I don't think that, uh, that the government of Israel can be faulted for the barbarity of its opponent and said that its self-defense has to be limited because of that. That is, is a true terrorist veto over the security of the innocent victims of the terrorists themselves. Uh, and, and this is something that Israel has to continue uh, to, to fight for because nobody else is going to do it for them. And they are under... <laughs> they are under enormous pressure from the government of the United States today. I mean enormous pressure to have a ceasefire. Why? Because if you get a six-week ceasefire, the hope is it'll never start again. And if it never starts again, Hamas will be back. Just like a climbing weed, it's going to come back. So this is, this is very much a time of testing, and it is a, a, a reality uh, of international geopolitics that sometimes when a conflict begins, there's only one way to end it. And that's when one side wins. It's no mistake, in my view, that Israel is in the same position today that Winston Churchill saw Great Britain in at the beginning of World War II when he said to the House of Commons, uh, uh, without victory, there is no survival. That was true then, and it's true today. And that's what Israel's policy should be, and we should support it. Thank you very much. Thank you for those wonderful insights delivered with acumen and uh, acumen and passion. I, I want to follow up a little bit on Iran. Y you labored very, very hard in government in the previous administration to impose real sanctions on Iran. Could you talk about what real sanctions would be and how we can get to that? Yeah, e economic sanctions were uh, really uh, conceived in the 20th century by Woodrow Wilson, just to make sure we know their patrimony, uh, as a way to avoid war. Not, not to keep the peace, but to wage economic warfare uh, and not military warfare. And the sanctions, I think, as we've seen in the past 30 years in a variety of contexts, only work when they're very broad, when they're imposed swiftly and completely, and when they're enforced. And I have to say, in successive administrations, this is a bipartisan criticism, we have failed in the enforcement side of sanctions. Um, it, it, is, it, is, uh, 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 it requires the real scrutiny of what the targets of the sanctions do, because once you announce uh, that you're going after them. They don't sit peacefully and accept it. They find ways to evade the sanctions. Right now, Russia has largely evaded uh, the critical sanctions imposed on them uh, after the invasion of Ukraine. 
uh, on uh, Iran. The administration has loosened the sanctions and allowed Iran to sell as much oil uh, almost as before the sanctions were reimposed when we got out of the nuclear deal. Uh, and that, that funding for Iran has been critical in, uh, in its support for the terrorist surrogate proxies and, and for the continuation of its nuclear and ballistic missile programs. If you're not prepared to be uh, harsh in not just announcing the sanctions but enforcing them, they're going to fail. And it will give your adversaries uh, the conviction that you're not really serious and it will make matters worse, not better. And you have certainly been a, a strong advocate for the use of American military force uh, in response to the, the string of attacks that we have seen against our bases and our ships. Could you talk a little bit more about what we ought to be doing and why that's been so absent from our, from our toolbox of responses? Well, I think our objective to get, to get to peace and security, you have to put the aggressors back in their box. Uh, some aggressive regimes uh, don't learn the lesson and the only real remedy is regime change, which is an unpopular phrase now, but it happens to be accurate. But even if you don't want to go to that extent, if a country thinks it can pose cost on us without comparable cost to them, they will do it. So if they think they can uh, attack Americans in, through the, the Shia militia proxies in, in Syria and Iraq, they'll, they'll do it. And they don't mind it when we retaliate against the proxies because they're expendable. Uh, so Iran in this entire period since October the 7th has suffered no pain. Uh, its proxies have suffered pain. They don't care about that pain. Uh, and until Iran understands that uh, we don't accept their pursuit of nuclear weapons, their ballistic missile programs, their support of terrorism, they're just going to continue doing it. Uh, the use of force is not intended to escalate. It's intended to de-escalate, to show they cannot get away with striking us or our friends uh, without a cost that ultimately they will find unacceptable. That's how you put them back in the box. Thank you for that. Moving a little bit wider uh, in our vision of the Middle East, what will be the effect of the Abraham Accords, or perhaps I should say, how is the crisis going to affect that trajectory? I think it will slow it down, but it won't stop. At the Abraham Accords, there was some important diplomacy that was involved there, but they reflect the shift in the tectonic plates in the Middle East where the Gulf Arab states came to realize that their greatest fear was uh, stemmed from Iran and support for terrorist threats to their regimes. And they looked around and they realized perhaps to, to their surprise, certainly to their surprise, that their strategic view of Iran happened to be exactly the same as Israel's. So for, with that as a foundation, they said, you know, may, maybe there's some advantage to cooperating with Israel, especially because they saw over time the United States as a feckless friend, an unreliable friend to them. And they figured that there was a natural benefit uh, to finding ways to use their enormous assets, their financial assets from their sale of hydrocarbons, uh, and to join up with the creativity, innovation, and, uh, and business uh, uh, opportunities with Israel, uh, which also added to the strategic dimension a potential economic component as well as a political military component. Now, I've been in Saudi Arabia three times since October the 7th, and I'm convinced that, uh, that the, the advantages to the Saudis of uh, entering into a, a version of the Abraham Accords with Israel is going to prevail no matter what. And as has happened before, a lot's going on below public notice. That This is going to happen, and it will happen, uh, I think, uh, I increasingly because they understand in the capitals of the Gulf Arab states that this, this is not an Arab war. They don't see this as an Arab war against Israel. They know exactly where the war came from. And that is further strength to the foundation, I think, to build on diplomatically. 
The issue of the Palestinians will remain a catalyst. It will remain a, um, a place of contention. And as you pointed out, the, um, the idea that one can simply form states is not a, uh, one that seems to have a whole lot of um, salience. What are your thoughts about how this can be resolved? And in particular, what's the onus that this puts on Egypt and Jordan? <clears throat> well, I once had a theory of the three-state solution, that you give Gaza back to Egypt, divide up the West Bank, have Jordan assume sovereignty over whatever they and Israel agree on, and everything would be fine, it, which was a great idea, except the Jordanians and the Egyptians didn't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> and and it, it's... Uh, but I start from the proposition that the two-state solution is dead. It was dead before October the 7th. Uh, it's certainly dead now. And it's dead because you cannot have a viable economic and ultimately, therefore, a viable political entity consisting of the Gaza Strip and a bunch of dots on the West Bank. It doesn't work. The Palestinian people have been abused for a long time beginning particularly in the 1950s and 60s when the radical Arab states weaponized the Palestinians as part of the drive to push Israel into the sea. Well, that's not going to happen. But the, but the Palestinians remain weaponized, and uh, it's feared as much in the Arab states as in, uh, as in Israel. The, the Egyptians who made it through a brief governance period by the Muslim Brotherhood, look at Hamas, correctly is a subsidiary of the Muslim Brotherhood. They don't need any more trouble than they already have. But let's, let's just take the humanitarian needs of the Palestinian people, and I think especially the Gazans. They want a future for their children, and the only way you can have a future is to be in a viable economic situation. So the answer is not rebuild Gaza. The answer is resettle the Palestinians somewhere else in a real economy. That's for their own good. People say, but that's forced resettlement. How about being forced to go back into Gaza? How's that for a future? You know, if any of you have been to refugee camps around the world, it's harder to imagine a worse place than a refugee camp that deadens the human imagination. And that's what's happened to the Palestinians for one generation after another. You know, in 1957, after the Suez Canal crisis of 1956, there were 300,000 ref there were 300,000 people in the Gaza Strip. 285,000 were refugees. There was a plan to resettle them along the east bank of the Suez Canal that never went through. If if that had happened, we'd be in a different world today. For, I would argue for the good of the Palestinian people, resettlement is the only option, and the Arab states are, are going to have to find a way to live with it. We can help them in some ways, but, but this is, this, it may take a long time, but rebuilding the refugee camps in Gaza is only going to re recreate the situation we saw on October the 6th. Given that there was a, a real and ugly shooting war between the Jordanians and the Palestinians, that's of course going back into the 80s, uh, do you think that, that other Arab nations in the Middle East can put the necessary pressure on Jordan and Egypt to effect this? Well, I, I think we're going to have to get other Arab states to step up, too. I think the population levels are so high. And I think, uh, you know, in a perfect world, we'd have the country really responsible take some refugees, Iran, namely. Uh, and I'd love, to, I'd love to be part of the refugee resettlement program in Iran. I'm not saying this is going to be easy, but, but do you think that doing what we've been doing unsuccessfully is going to produce a different result? This is the old definition of insanity, of keep doing the same thing and thinking it will be different. The, this is not the opportunity to build the two-state solution, which wasn't going to work before. This is a time to try something very, very different. I want to move um, in the next few minutes, and then we'll go to audience Q&A, a little bit more widely to the way America behaves in the world. You, you stressed the importance of our support of allies, which is a place where we often fall short. And, of course, there's um, 
no limit to the ability of uh, the West and America for self-inflicted wounds. Uh, do we have staying power? And I guess the answer to that is uh, just look around us. H how do we remedy this? The, the ability to stick to a cause, to support our allies. You had written in the room where it happened uh, painfully about our abandonment of the Kurds. Uh, what's the way forward? Well, I think America has suffered from a lack of political leadership uh, uh, really since the collapse of communism. Uh, if you reflect back to the early 1990s, people talked about the end of history. Uh, uh, there was a peace dividend because we could reduce defense budgets because there was no more threat of war. Uh, Globalization was going to take care of everything. Uh, remember in 1992, it was the economy stupid. Internationally, political risk had disappeared. Really, what could go wrong? Uh, and, so, and so our political leaders stopped making the case uh, that I think is critical that preserving the American way of life requires strong American presence internationally. Uh, the, what little order there is in the world since 1945 has been supplied by American power, reflected in part through our alliances. Uh, there isn't anybody out, else out there that's going to do it for us, and there isn't anybody else out there that's capable of doing it. Where we withdraw from an area, as many people, including now in the Republican Party, say we can't fight wars in Europe, we can't worry about the Middle East, let's just worry about Asia. Uh, when we leave an area, the vacuum doesn't last long. Our adversaries fill it. A lot of people, a lot of people in this, in this era when isolationism is increasing say, why, why, are we, why are we doing all this for these people around the world? Uh, you know, we've got the Mexican border to worry about. We've got our own people to worry about. And the answer is, we're not doing it for them. We're doing it for us. We are the ones who benefit from a strong American presence in the world. We are the ones whose power, sea power in particular, uh, protects international trade. We, we are the ones that provides whatever minimal stability it is. When we withdraw, stability will decrease and that ultimately will, help, will hurt us. Our politicians don't understand it. They don't make the case. When they do make the case, don't want to offend anybody here, but they talk about democracy versus authoritarianism. Uh, let me be clear, I'm in favor of democracy, I'm against authoritarianism. What I'm more in favor of is protecting American national interests so that our ability to do everything we do here uh, is preserved and expands and so that our allies benefit from it as well. A lot of them don't bear their fair share of the burden that's true, and we ought to push them to do it. But are we really to say, well, this country isn't doing its fair share, so even if it damages our national security, we're going to throw them out of the NATO alliance or something like that? That's called cutting off your nose to spite your face. What we need are politicians who understand America's place in the world, make the case to the American voter, who is an intelligent, rational person, they will understand the burden that has to be borne, and they will bear it. Uh, it is a big mistake. It, it is a big mistake to underestimate us and what I tell our foreign friends when they complain about this or that or the other thing, I tell them, don't bet against America. Thank you for that. I hear the voice of Pericles, or at least Winston Churchill. Uh, one final question, if you'll permit me. I, I, I want to go back a little bit in history, and it's by way of saying a thank you that I'm sure everybody in this room feels as well. You spearheaded the, the work in the United Nations to overturn the Zionism is racism uh, resolution. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the circumstances and how that all happened? Well, a lot, thank you. A lot, of, a lot of people worked on that over a long period of time. But when I, when I joined the George H.W. Bush administration, I was assistant secretary in charge of international organizations. Uh, even before I had, had been confirmed, I went to Geneva to stop the PLO from becoming a member of the World Health Organization. 
Uh, and this, this was part of the PLO's view that if they could, because UN agencies require you to be a state before you can be a member, that if they became members of UN organizations, they would be a state, which is silly, but that's the way they, they that was the logic. And, uh, and we were successful, we stopped them in the WHO, we stopped them in UNESCO, uh, it was, there was a long campaign. But in the course of that, I, I became aware of how uh, infused the United Nations and, and including many of its member states were with the remnants of the Zionism is racism resolution. And it occurred to me that uh, if there were ever gonna be UN reform, which is a thankless task, I can assure you, if there were ever gonna be UN reform, it had to start with repealing that resolution. So I talked to my boss, Jim Baker, talked to the president, and they said, we will do this, get ready. And uh, so I worked with the Israeli government, it took two years. Uh, we had an extraordinary diplomatic campaign, President Bush, we decided to do it in the fall of uh, 1991. Uh, President Bush was calling people, Secretary Baker was calling people. We were, I once got the American ambassador in Togo, and I said, we, do, we don't have Togo on our list of co-sponsors yet. He said, John, there's a coup going on. So I said, go find the coup leaders and get them to sign on to it. <laughs> You got to be determined, and and we won, and it was uh, it was the it was a symbol of the end of the Cold War, with the last vote of the Soviet Union as a member of uh, of the UN was was to vote to repeal ZR. So uh, it's it's uh, persistence pays off, and it was a great honor for me uh, to be a part of that effort. And I love winning. Let's face it. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to end with um, the words of Rabbi Tarfan from the fourth century. We're, we're not commanded to bring every task to perfection. We are commanded never to give up, and you have never given up. And with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Rabbi Minsky. Um, and um, Ambassador Bolton has very kindly uh, agreed to answer questions. And let me reiterate the admonition. It has to be a question, and it has to be short. I promise, Paul. Uh, Two-part question. One, if... Uh, <laughs> it'll be short. Uh, certainly, uh, from what you said, uh, uh, Iran being involved and, and, and being the engine behind the uh, the terrorists, uh, what, what would you suggest would be the, the way to make them feel some pain? And a second question would be your thoughts on the current stalemate with the, uh, uh, the bill in Congress to support Israel, Ukraine, and what have you. Yeah. Well, the, the second one is easy. Uh, you know, America should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, and uh, the, the Senate has basically passed this bill. Uh, uh, you never get everything you want, and people who only know how to say no ultimately uh, really don't deserve to be in government. So I think uh, one way or another through the parliamentary haze, they've got to find a way to pass it. The sooner the better, and it's a sad commentary that we're having, having this trouble. Each component of the bill being something that's worthwhile, and yet none of them uh, can, can pull it through. In terms of Iran, uh, let me just say, I, I believe for, I don't know, 30 years that the only real answer to Iran is to overthrow the regime. These people are medieval religious fanatics, and today it is in, in Iran effectively a military dictatorship. I think the regime is less popular now than at any point since 1979. Uh, the trouble is that the regime has the guns and the people don't. Uh, the crisis point will come when, when the Ayatollah Khamenei, who's maybe 84 and not in good health, passes from the scene. There have only been two supreme leaders. They don't exactly have an established uh, succession process. That's when you could crack the top of the government and, and, and possibly bring the regime down. In the short term, um, uh, there are a lot of targets that you could strike if we thought it was appropriate that don't threaten the regime, but show we don't buy the Iranian red line. You could take out their air defenses. 
which have the secondary benefit of making it easier the next time we decide we have to go in. You can take out Revolutionary Guard bases in Western Iran where for two decades they have trained these militia to kill Americans in Iran. 200 or more American service members have been killed in the last 20 years by uh, Iran-backed militia. And uh, not in Iran, but you can take out palpably Iranian targets like the naval vessels they have in the Red Sea helping the Houthis target commercial ships. Uh, the Iranians say it's a red line to strike targets in Iran. You know, we said it's a red line if you kill Americans. They crossed our red line, we should cross theirs. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this audience is obviously very simpatico with everything you've said. I'd like to better understand, you be behind closed doors, I'd like to understand the thinking on the other side. A uh, question, please. The question is, what, what happens behind closed doors um, that gets it so wrong today? Our leaders, obviously, have a diametrically opposite view of the world as you do. I'm trying to understand their mindset as to how they can come to those conclusions. And uh, going forward, whether you see either party being able to adopt your view rather than the current view. Right. Well, I, I'm, I'm probably the last person to ask why their mindset is the way that it is. <laughs> but, but I think the short answer is they're, they're in a time bubble. They're, they're reacting to what they thought was happening 10 or 15 years ago, and they're pursuing uh, policies that, that have, have been discredited and they just don't realize it. And I think there's a political component to it as well. And... Uh, it's a, it's a component that's troubling, not in, in just a basic political sense, but is troubling for the country as a whole, that there's a substantial part of the population that opposes Israel in this conflict. If you look at support for people under 30, support for Israel is about 25%. It's a stunning number, a stunning number, and dangerous. And I think in part, that's, what, that's what's affecting them because the November election is bearing down on us will have the election, it'll come out whatever way it comes out. That 25% figure of support for Israel is, is a toxic uh, level that, uh, that we need to think about. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, we have this election coming up and uh, I just want to know in your opinion, which one of these two candidates would be better for us, for Israel? Am I, <laughs> you, you, you've caused a stir of discussion. My, my, my view is very straightforward. Neither one of them is fit to be president. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to thank you so much for coming here. I think you're really clear and unhedged like nobody else has spoken here. Paul, I'd like to thank you and the other people at the temple here who've done this speaker series. I think it's great. Here's my question. If you got the call from Biden, uh, Blinken, and Jake Sullivan to come to the White House and tell them how this is going to end in a year, what would you tell them? And what, what should they do? Well, I'd tell them what I just told you. And, and uh, I don't think they'd listen. Uh, but I, I, look, I, I, will, I, would, I would tell anybody, including Donald Trump, what I, what I thought. Right. That was my problem in the administration. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not alone. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you one more. My grandfather, Arthur Stern, uh, gave a 17-year-old German-Jewish immigrant named Henry Kissinger his first job in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and his uh, Brush family, Pastor, excuse me. He also got him the full ride scholarship to Harvard. Okay. Who, are Question, other, please. who are the other Henry Kissingers and John Boltons in the administration today, if there are any, or that you think are on the you know, horizon? Thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I am worried that... Uh, Within, within our society as a whole, there aren't enough people thinking about international strategy. In the Democratic Party, there's a form of isolationism which says the only thing we have to worry about is welfare programs in the United States, and international affairs will be taken care of by the United Nations. Now, that's a fantasy, but that's what a lot of them believe. Isolationism of a different form is spreading in the Republican Party. And, uh, you know, if we've lost the Democrats, that's bad enough. I, I wouldn't mind a, 
Joe Lieberman, Scoop Jackson wing reappearing in the Democratic Party, but it's not there, let's be honest. If isolationism prevails in the Republican Party, we are in deep, deep trouble. So if you don't give, especially the younger people who understand the, the, the importance of grand strategy, as they like to call it, they're never gonna get experience in government uh, and, and they won't learn from it. And when the crisis comes, as it will, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of time before we see China, for example, take advantage of our distraction, our, our bandwidth being consumed by Ukraine, uh, the Middle East, and uh, the presidential campaign, we're gonna be in deep trouble. More people need to think about the role of America in the world and why the importance of a strong American position is critical to the way of life we have here at home. If you don't understand that point, then all this stuff is just abstract. If you understand that point, you can, you can see why it's critical that we maintain our strength and that that's the best way to achieve peace. The Romans used to say, si vis pacem, parabellum. Mm -hmm. If you want peace, prepare for war. Uh, George Washington said almost exactly that in the first State of the Union message. Uh, and Ronald Reagan used to say, peace through strength. I, I don't think it's hard to understand, but not enough people do. Yes. Um, thank you for being here. I wanted to ask you, could Israel stand against the United States? How could she do it? Especially where today uh, Israel is totally dependent uh, militarily on the United States and its uh, uh, support uh, uh, financially that has to be spent 100% in the United States. And uh, also uh, with, with the fact that uh, the United States is trying to also cha make a, a, um, a change in the, in the uh, government of Israel. Yeah, well, I, I would prefer not, not to think about how to, uh, uh, to make Israel able to act independently of the United States. I'd like to change the United States so it wasn't hampering Israel's effort to defend itself. <laughs> because it's not in America's interest to do that. I mean, the policy that's being pursued ultimately it certainly will harm Israel in the short term. It will harm America in the long term. This is not the way you treat an ally that's had an existential attack uh, on, on its very nationhood. And, and uh, so that's why Americans have to explain to the White House that, that they're pursuing the wrong policy. And, and not, seeing, not seeing the big picture. This is not about Hamas and the Gaza Strip. Ultimately, it's not. That is the focus of attention. That's not the epicenter of the conflict or the threat. Sorry. Go on, keep going. Go okay, more questions? It's all right. Yeah. I agree with your um, regime change in Iran as one, one of the solutions. However, regime change can take a long time. Uh, Iran is on a path uh, to acquire uh, nuclear weapons. Question, please. Yes. Do you, what do you feel should be done now uh, regarding the nuclear weapon threat? Because I think Iran will be more difficult to deal with once they have nuclear weapons. Sure. The, look, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been focused on the Iran nuclear program for 30 years. And we have blown so many opportunities to stop the program that it's hard to count. Uh, we've, we've done exactly the same thing, made exactly the same mistakes with respect to North Korea, uh, which is much further along than Iran. People ask me, how long would it take Iran to get nuclear weapons? The answer is about 72 hours. They send a bank draft to the Central Bank of North Korea in Pyongyang. Pyongyang puts a nuclear weapon or two on a plane, flies it over China. Bingo, they've got nuclear weapons. And by the way, North Korea's missiles are much better than Iran's, although they both started from the same Soviet-era Scud missile technology. So, so this, is, this, this is part of, if you look at this new axis that I talked about, Iran, North Korea, both nuclear proliferation threats are part of it. That's not by accident. Uh, China has covered for North Korea for 50 years and the Russians in effect have covered for Iran. So the, the, the short term that we can do is enforce the sanctions against Iran, get the Europeans to do the same, cut off their supply of money, uh, and, and make sure that, uh, uh, that, uh, that they're not getting adequate resources to fund 
either their support for terrorism or the weapons program. But ultimately, the Iranians are not going to give up the quest for nuclear weapons as long as this regime is in power. So at some point, you have to ask the question, are we prepared to use military force against the nuclear program? And my answer to that is yes. Not, not because I'm looking for conflict, because I want to avoid a situation where this regime has the most powerful weapons uh, that mankind has ever had. Uh, this, is, this, this evokes this problem with Iran and with North Korea, calls to mind another Churchill quote where he once said, he talked about what he called the confirmed unteachability of mankind. That over and over again, you can see the opportunity to deal with a problem when it's small enough and when the consequences of dealing with it will be manageable, and you wait until the problem becomes almost unmanageable, uh, and, and, uh, and, and you risk your entire country to have to do it. That's what happened in World War II. And I look at Iran and North Korea, and I see the same pattern. And we, we are desperately close to the point of no return with North Korea, and I don't think Iran is too far behind. Okay, let's have a, maybe one more question, and then we will thank Ambassador Bolton. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my question goes back to your comment about reforming the UN. And my question is, why bother? The, the UN, I think it's a fair statement to say, it's evolved into an anti-US, anti-Israel organization. And in this war, we've learned that actually the UN workers were supporters of Hamas and helped create this war. Peacemaking organizations, ineffective. So again, what role do you think the UN actually plays in today's world? Well, it, does, it doesn't uh, play much of a constructive role, although there are components of the UN, the specialized agencies that, that do good work. Um, I'm actually writing a piece now to, to try and argue to Trump's advisors to throw them a piece of red meat that they can go after instead of NATO. And the UN comes readily to mind as something that uh, he could do a lot of work with. You know, the UN is a vast agency uh, with many parts. As I say, some parts of it uh, uh, do productive work and, and you need to separate the sheep from the goats. Uh, but, but, but there's an incredible amount of wastage. The key political components of the UN, the Security Council, the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council are broken beyond repair. Uh, and so we can save a lot of money and get out of a lot of organizations. In terms of the UN itself, my, my, my friend and, and uh, somebody I've admired, admired for a long time before she died, Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, was once asked, should we withdraw from the United Nations? And she paused for a second and said, no, it's not worth the effort. <laughs> Ambassador Bolton, thank you for this wisdom, for your courage, for your unwavering, unwavering courage.